Today's guest on the Kenyan Yoga Podcast is Andrew Epler. So Andrew's done incredible work on the Mysore traditions. This is Krishnamacharya's lineage. He's interviewed old students of Krishnamacharya around that time, other people involved. Um, there's an amazing film that accompanies uh, his other work, uh, his written work and his interviews and his uh, workshops that he arranges with, with some of the old students that Krishnamacharya actually taught at that time. Um, and the Maestro Traditions film, if you haven't seen it, is a fantastic film. So first of all, I want to just simply thank Andrew for his work and um, acknowledge that that work for all of us from the Ashtanga Yoga community. Aside from that, I want to say today's podcast is actually sponsored by Om Yoga Magazine. And I want to say a few words about Om. Um, I really like the magazine, actually. It's a perfect read for anyone interested in yoga um, because it really is about yoga as a lifestyle. Whether you're taking your first steps on the mat or you've been practicing for years, you're a teacher or a student, it's loads of advice and guidance on everything from online yoga these days, of course, to making meditation work for you on a practical level. What does it actually mean in practical life, right? An issue which you know is dear to my heart. Loads of tips, loads of ideas, uh, news from the yoga world, news, you know, like what's going on around the world and yoga, you know. It's really quite a, you know, quite a, a, a fun uh, and informative magazine to have a little leaf through. Omyogamagazine.com is their website. And um, it, as I said, it's embracing yoga as a lifestyle, more than just the shapes on the mat, right? But about nutrition, family, the spirit in action, a whole perspective, a holistic perspective of yoga as a, a way of life, as an attitude to life, as an approach to life. I can't recommend Om Yoga Magazine enough find them on yoga.com on yoga magazine sorry on magazine.com and have a little look let me know see what you think anyway back to our interview welcome andrew so welcome andrew to keen on yoga um it's been best part of two years i think since we chatted before um yeah. i think it was a long time ago now but lovely to have you and i remember that chat at the time right and um how much i enjoyed it actually so today andrew's going to come on um particularly we wanted to talk about this uh nath sampradaya that um is i think the basis of your work really these days right this sort of kind of like parampra lineage yeah yeah thank you for having me adam i appreciate it it's always a pleasure yeah it's um, lovely to have you so, Natamuni Sampradaya is the spiritual tradition that Sri Krishnamacharya came from. So, in my curiosity to find out more about where yoga comes from and who's sort of responsible for this yoga that, that's been a great influence in my life, I, I've been studying this, uh, this particular lineage and tradition. I know you've been studying it for all your life, right? I mean, your as I remember, your father introduced you to it, and then kind of there you were young, weren't you? Kind of under twenty or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Billy, I mean, um, you deserve a lot more um, renownedness for for your work on yoga. I think. Um, so, I mean, trying to get a better handle on this, first of all, for our listenership that might not really know what a, the Nath or the Sampradaya is, and you know, these terms are becoming more and more popular, you know, in the in the general yoga sphere. Um, do you want to kind of clarify? I mean, Sampradaya, we kind of know that's a group, right? That's basically means a group. But but the Nath thing, the Nath thing is a little bit more complicated because there's a bunch of different Naths, as I understand it, right? There's not just one. Yeah. Right. Like, knots are actually one of the five major sects of sadhus, and and th that's two different things, uh, actually. They're, they're sort of dreadlocks to the ground, ashes of the dead, chillums, and all this. Um, Nathamuni, on the other hand, was one of the acharyas in a particular 
Vaishnava lineage. And that lineage happens to be the lineage which Sri Krishnamacharya comes from. <clears throat> so in in trying to understand, well, where did this yoga come from? Like the first and most obvious thing is we're doing these postures. Where do these postures come from? How old are they? How do we know? Who said? Who taught it? How do we how do we trace this asana practice? So that leads down a pretty familiar path that kind of dead ends. Um, Krishnamacharya studied with Rama Mohan Brahmacharya, who nobody actually knows anything about. And there's a bunch of conflicting stories, and it pretty much dead ends there. When we want to trace the asana lineage, we roughly end up saying, well, in Tibet, there are a lot of old texts which have quite a lot of hatha yoga asana sequences and probably it migrated from there and there is of course this you know um <clears throat> hatha vyasa padati that uh, some very excellent scholars have worked with jason birch and jim mallinson and there's this yoga karunta which we're like 80% sure is Hatha Vyasa Padati and then still some murky uncertainty there. Um, but it's kind of been done and it's kind of, uh, you know, we, we know what we know about that and I, and I think new stuff will emerge over time. But what I was sort of interested to look at was, well, who are these people who gave us this practice and what do they believe? And most are stronger practitioners believe in, you know, Padampada, right? Right. We're, we're all part of a Padampada, but we don't most, mostly don't know what that actually is. Um, but theoretically there's some ancient lineage, which we are kind of a part of by virtue of doing sun salutations or something to that effect. But what the hell actually is that? <laughs> and, and who is it? And, and you know, so, so to the best of my um, studies so far, when you, when you try to trace the asana practice, you kind of hit a dead end at uh, Rama Mohan Brahmacharya and some speculation about various texts. When you try to study and look at the spiritual tradition that Sri Krishnamacharya came from, it's all crystal clear. It's all right there. All of the people going back a thousand years are listed. And, and there are all these Acharyas who did various things and wrote various texts. And one, so, so this Sampradaya is alive and well in India and Mysore. And my teacher, Lakshmi Tadachar was the acharya of that sampradaya, and when I when I started, it, it all started, of course, with making Mysore Yoga Traditions film, and and you know the first thing I I thought was, oh my God, these guys are amazing. I I want to talk to them as much as possible. Like, how can we learn more from these guys? They know a lot uh, more than I ever even imagined. Let's let's try to dig deeper here. And so I started calling him, told him I couldn't quit thinking about him, and that if he would accept my calls, I was going to call. <laughs> and uh, we had a few sort of awkward conversations, but I asked him to teach me about the Bhagavad Gita because I, I knew that that was their core text. And so <clears throat> what he started to teach me was called the Gitata Sangraha, which is a, a summary of the Bhagavad Gita written by Yamunacharya roughly a thousand years ago. And it's 32 verses, and it deals very succinctly with the, um, the philosophy of the, of the Gita. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, we didn't make it through that text. Um, he, he caught COVID and died. Um, uh, bit of a year ago and I spoke to him like three days before and uh, we had a very sweet conversation 
Um, but it was a tragic loss for mm. for mm. everybody, mm. Um, mm -hmm. himself and and. But now, um, like all good acharyas, he trained his successor, and so his eldest son is uh, Sri Ima Alwar, and he is now the acharya, and he's also the co-organizer of Mysore Yoga Conference. Right. So. So we just stumbled onto these guys, and and I I didn't know who they were. It, it, you you find out who someone is, especially Indian people, over a period of years. If you continue to interact with them, the, the, the picture so, slowly fills in. Just to clarify to the audience, I mean, Krishnamacharya wasn't an acharya himself of this this nut lineage, was he? He had an acharya, right? I think it's misleading to say nut because right. not implies this uh, sect of sadhus. Okay. And, and so there are kapalikas and knots and agora. Uh, <laughs> but Natamuni Sampradaya, and then there are there's some other terms for it, but mostly Tadachar always called it Natamuni Sampradaya. Um, he, so, so he started telling me the stories and the, about the tradition right away from the time that I started studying him with him. And Krishnamacharya was certainly a member of that lineage. And I don't believe he was an, an Acharya, although his name is. It the ends with a, He's, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, like, you know, I call him Tadachar, but Lakshmi Tadacharya Swami G is his full title. I know, of course, all these people have huge titles. Um, so, yes. And, uh, you, you know, Krishnamacharya wrote Yoga Rahasya, and, and it was supposed to be a, kind of a vision that he had of Natamuni. And he sort of downloaded this information and... Um, in the Indian worldview, that's legit. In the sort of Western worldview, that's called daydreaming. We have no time for that. <laughs> but nonetheless, saints and holy people from down through the ages have had moments of revelation, which they went on to write down or begin to talk about, and other people wrote down. And in, in the case of the of the great Tamil sages, most of them actually did not read or write. They just had the relations and talked about them. It was scribes who did all the pushing. That was not considered <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> and people are born into this lineage, right? You don't, you don't kind of join it, right? Like Krishnamacharya was a Vaishnava. He was born with his family into this uh, Nathya. Is it Nathya Muni? Am I, am I getting it right? No. That Jamuni lineage, um, and how many? You know, just get a handle on it. How many people are, are, are in this at any one time? Is it a large group of people, and do they have any no. connection with each other? Um, do they, they meet do. up, you know. Um, okay, that that link that I sent you is pretty comprehensive in in covering all, all of the. Yeah, the, and we'll put uh, that link in the notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, Ramanuja was the founder of Vishishta Advaita philosophy. Okay, so he's around a thousand years ago. And uh, so you had Natamuni and then his grandson, Yamunacharya, and then Ramanuja. These three Acharyas lived pretty close together in time, like within the span of, a, of two, three hundred years. And they were you know, among the big guys. And there's always been an Acharya in that lineage. And them are outstanding and, and did things. So Ramanuja founded Vishishta Advaita, and, and he also appointed 74 ministers, if you will, for lack of a better term. There, there's a Sanskrit term for it. But um, those guys were called Ayankar, and it means they were entrusted with five rites or rituals. So anyone from India with the name Iyengar 
is a descendant of one of those 74 guys that Ramanuja appointed. Okay. So each of those 74 went on and, and, you know, the generations passed and they all had their individual lineages. And as most of them, as far as I know, most of them crumbled and, and lost their continuity. This Natamuni Sampradaya is the last unbroken lineage of the Iyengars. And because of the modern world, because everybody wanted to move to America and become an engineer, and you know the, the old traditional ways were looked on as being somewhat backwards. And so, so it was a great sacrifice. And people like Lakshmi Tadachar and his son, these guys are so brilliant. <laughs> they have a really a huge intellect. And if they should want to be an engineer or any other thing, they could certainly succeed in that. <laughs> so but they're the last link to Ramanuja. That's that's they, that's right. 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 That's, that's my and understanding. I mean, I suppose we could for the again for the sake of clarification, because I know this stuff, you know, you've done a lot of research and it comes easily to you, but you know, it's kind of complicated for a lot of people, right? just trying to get their head head around this right so just asking the questions that might come to someone's mind is like well who does Ra ramanuja who was he um and the, the essential question which we've been circling around and haven't come to yet is what does he stand for and therefore what does krishnamacharya stand for how you know how does that inform the the worldview of krishnamacharya i mean we know that it's a fish uh uh advaita so you know it's qualified dualism um what what does this all this mean? What is all of it? I've been working on that forever, and I'm I don't feel even qualified. You know, the more I learn, the less I know. But um, Ramanuja was, I forget who his acharya was, but he famously defeated his acharya in debate. His acharya was a a, a dual a, a non dualist, so his acharya was Advaita. And he defeated him in debate, yelled the secret mantra from the rooftop of the ashram, and had to flee because his loving Acharya really wanted to kill him. <laughs> and um, so he was in exile for a number of years. Twelve of those years he spent in Melkote, which is a village about an hour and a half's drive from Mysore. And that, you know, there's all sorts of history and stories and stuff that happened there, but he established a very strong uh, ashram there and temple there, and that all still exists. And that's where Tadachar lived. That's where Sri Alwar grew up. And there's a huge connection with the yoga of Mysore and Melkote. So um, Ramanuja authored this qualified non-dual practice, which is essentially essentially saying, yes, it's all one thing that's true, but there's some categories. And the, the, the famous example is the, you know, you hold a candle and you say, well, this candle is the same thing as the sun. But the candle is not equal to the sun. The candle is little and the sun is big. So Krishna and Arjuna, when they were having their discussion Arjuna was not equal to Krishna. He, they, they're not the, you know, they're made of the same thing, but they're not equal. So, so very, very basically qualified like oneness. Yeah, yeah. Now, this philosophy, because I, I personally, I come from a whole family full of ministers, Christian ministers, and I grew up with the Bible and and all, all of this stuff. So, for me. It's very much about looking for the, the parallels and, and also the, the differences in the, the two systems and, and trying to understand what these guys are all about. And um, that's been a beautiful journey. And, and I, uh, you, you don't have to believe somebody else's religion if you practice yoga. And no one ever said that you did. Um, all of these all of these great teachers are simply saying that um, you got to figure it out for yourself. Life is uh, full of challenges. Everybody dies in the end. 
everybody's suffering and everybody's enjoying according to our actions and our karma and so many things. And um, philosophy is how we deal with our life based on our experience. You know, Svadhyaya is study. And that's part of the story with Patanjali. And that, it doesn't just mean read books. It means work on your worldview. Read the great books. Look at your life and say, how does all that reply, you know, apply to my silly little life here? And, you, you know, whenever I'm doing this, this happens. And why is that? And, you know, it's about experience. So you don't have to believe in some particular god or deity. To- Do you think it made a difference, though, with between, I mean, we know Patabi Joyce was a Shaivite, right? He wasn't part of the uh, Ramanuja lineage. Uh, BKS was, obviously, um, and Iyengar, and, uh, you know, um, TLV was. So um, Krishnamacharya's viewpoint and the way he related to the yoga he was practicing and teaching could we say that was different to the way that Patabi Joyce might have related to it? Can we give any examples of how they might have seen things differently apart from the, you know, the qualified oneness of the world? Or would they actually have treated the practice differently or looked upon what they were doing differently in any pra- practical way, we could say? In terms of – I've thought a lot about this because it, it's true that that all of this, you know, you, you could just look. The, the guys with this on their forehead are Vaishnava and the guys with this on their forehead are Shiva. and there has been a long rivalry there and and difference between the, the two. And so honest truth is that I don't know. I, I, I never had a chance to really study philosophy with Tabi Joyce. Um, I know that he always gave his, his uh, credit to Krishnamacharya and, and that Krishnamacharya's yoga – is considered to be kind of the foundations of modern yoga by many people. Um, when we look at all the people who trained and who they taught, we, we can say that Krishnamacharya's yoga accounts for at least half asana practice throughout the world, probably a bit more than that, but safely half. Um, but what are the differences in philosophy? Probably, you know, th- they're, they're, they're Shivites, so you can read the Shiva Puranas and you, you can find some differences. It's kind of like Democrats and Republicans in America. There's really great people on both sides. Uh, and, you know, like I agree with everybody on some things. Um, but in terms of the practice and what one should do with one's body, no, there's no difference. That's considered a fairly basic universal or perhaps I, perhaps if i qualify my statement the objectives i guess you know i mean what the we know that the uh, uh krishnamacharya was strongly at trying to affiliate his yoga calling it ashtanga yoga indeed with patanjali now where does you know patanjali's viewpoint fit in with ramanuja um and is uh, and is the patanjalian perspective on yoga the one that krishnamacharya is is trying to present here or was trying to present and and did uh, Patabi Joyce circumscribed to that. Well, as I understand it, the the Mysore scholars always made a very clear differentiation between philosophy and religion. They all come from families that worship certain deities and have certain religious backgrounds, but they try to kind of keep that to one side. Um, and the difference between Patanjali's yoga and the yoga of the Bhagavad Gita are pretty stark. So, so what Guruji BNS Iyengar always said, and what Tadachar echoed, was that Patanjali is about self-realization, and and that you know there's really very little reference to any kind of deity in in Patanjali. There's just this this uh, Ishwara Pranidana. And, and also in Sankhya, which, which is the previous philosophy that yoga sort of builds upon, you don't find any reference to Godhead or deity. There's, there's Jivatma and Paramatma, but they, they're not so much about Bhakti. So anyway, simply put, according to the big guys, 
Patanjali's yoga leads to self-realization. Not the Muni's yoga or, or yoga, the Bhagavad Gita leads to God realization. But then we have this horrible question, like what is God and who, which one and <clears throat> who do I have to sign up with? And oh my God, whose, whose approval do I need to be part of this thing? And I'm sure I've done something rather wrong. And uh, will God accept me? And all of our sort of Western Christianity based uh, misconceptions. Yeah. Well, I suppose, I mean, remember Batavi Joyce always used to say, uh, you know, when, when you understand everything is God, right? You say, like, everything you know god looking or something like that there was a quote wasn't there you know about you know yeah. the ever you know the god you know a kind of advisor kind of esque take on god right rather than a, you know a, do we find more of a devotional aspect to krishna macharya and his in his uh the way that he's taking it yeah yeah that's basically it their worldview is simply that the whole world is the body of god and so that really did my head in because, you know, I mean, I take these things quite literally and, and that's a different worldview than I had previously. I, I can say, cause I sort of like some parts of the world and I think that those are sort of good and holy. You know, I like roses and sunsets and uh, beautiful yoga postures, but I don't like dead possums or, uh, you know, nuclear war or uh, there's so many there's things. A whole, that yeah, I, there's so many things. Yeah, especially <laughs> now. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> we don't have to list them. <laughs> yeah. old days. So, you know, how how can um, all of this terrible stuff going on in the world be God? Is a fundamental issue. But um, God's body has two parts, Prakriti and Purusha. And um, they, they basically insist that all of these unfoldments are the the organs of prakriti, and that uh, it's all for the evolution of the soul. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer in the evolution of your soul. <laughs> so um, that's an unanswerable question, anyway. That, you know, but um, fundamentally, whole world's body of God. Try to cultivate love and affection for God, which means everyone and everything around us, which uh, I find to be very challenging at some moments. <laughs> you know, I, and so, so the, the reason to practice all these asanas and to practice the pranayama and to practice everything it is to define ourselves and, and to remember also that that every action, every word, every thought is is, is karma and, and has a repercussion in our life. And that if we practice the asanas, we refine our nervous systems and, and we clean up. And it offers a much higher quality of life. And I think that you and me and everybody that's practiced yoga for many years would would firmly agree with that. Now, whether we believe it or not, that is a whole other issue but but the asanas are a fundamental way of entering into a different worldview and, so, so go ahead no i was going to say i suppose often my quandary my battle is between the advaita perspective which seems kind of imminent right so that you know this is what there is right everything is one you're experiencing it now there is nothing other outside better to aim for in the future. There is no future. There is no person to aim for. And then, you know, qualified and which is, you know, not a million miles away from, from dualism really is saying, well, this world, it's kind of imperfect. It's, it's matter. It's prakriti, right? And, you know, refining that prakriti, you'll gradually understand that the nature of yourself and Purusha and you will transcend this world, you know, in, uh, you know, and samsara gradually in some place better in the future. Um, I mean, uh, is that, you know, I mean, who, who believed what in that capacity? Did was Krishnamacharya? Do you think aiming for for the next life, or was he, you know, teaching a yoga for this life? How did he stand on that for this life? I, I think that is the specific uh, thing about uh, about Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is that it's supposed to give liberation in one life. You can you can make it this time. 
jump on the wagon. <laughs> this is the thing. But, and that's why it's very radical practice. Uh, and I think, I think we can agree that, that, um, people who start doing yoga every day at the same time in the same place, and it doesn't matter if you're in your living room or if you're going, if you live in New York City and you go to a Mysore Ashtanga class at 6 a.m. every morning, you start falling into that that very powerful ancient rhythm where you're doing this thing every single day and starts to work on your nervous system. And then you start to see that, oh my God, whenever I do this, I feel so much better that Obviously, wherever I was at before I did this was nonsense. This is, I, I have some mental problems. <laughs> I need to do this yoga to, to alleviate these, this, uh, you know, negativity and depression that sometimes troubles me. And uh, I don't care who you are. Life has its challenges and we have our ups and our downs. Yoga really helps us to find an up. Mm. I mean, he famously called it a practice for householders, right? Um, and that was the whole idea that Krishnamacharya was a father and was a family man, you know, and were living in the world, the same with Batavi Joyce. Um, but what, I mean, what would a practice not for householders mean? And why, why is this particularly good for householders? Well, my first teacher who introduced me to a stronger yoga, Cliff Barber, who passed away a year or two ago, he was a renunciate, and renunciates are always more powerful. I don't care. Like you, if you have kids, and I have four of them, so I can tell you, it's terrible for your yoga practice. Okay, like staying up all night with crying babies, being immersed in the material world, and having to earn money and having to take care of other people relating with another person as your partner and all of this takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, it's worth it and i i you know i'm not knocking householder life i am one but if one should decide to forego all that and just study and practice and cultivate oneself without in, involving oneself in in relations with other people and creating a family which inevitably ties you to the material world. Of course, you have a lot more attention and a lot more time to do, dedicate to your spiritual practice. That's a pretty obvious thing. So they're always a bit more intense. And uh, right. Clint's my <laughs> it was kind of like a compressed, like the Ashtanga was kind of compressed, kind of supercharged kind of practice that you could do and get kind of get this the idea is you could kind of do it and get the same results in less time you know like i think so i that that's very much the the uh idea that sri bns Iyengar puts forward in his talks and his, his philosophy that this is a very concentrated practice and it's for people who want to achieve liberation in this life and and so so i believe that they're using the Hatha Yoga methodology techniques, that it is a hybrid. And what we can say about Krishnamacharya and the people that he taught, never mind whether they're Shivites or Vaishnavas, it is that he was a kind of ambassador who took these radical Hatha Yoga practices and formatted them into something that the world could relate to uh, and, and uh, made it scientific he he made it about health he made it uh access to masses and and he that genius really does um that credit goes to him but it also goes to the royal family of mysore who paid paid him to do it and put him up to it and yeah. they were the one and it's probably tolerated him as well oh, okay. and, Yes, you know, there grou is. grouchy kind of character that he was. But, but, I mean, why didn't he teach anyone the philosophy part of it? You know, the, the background that he had in this uh, Matthew Mooney Sampradaya. I mean, he taught the kids the asana part of it. He never taught the philosophy. And your teacher, BNS Iyengar, um, also was taught by Krishnamacharya, I believe. And he taught you philosophy, I think. Atabi Rice, again, didn't teach the philosophy to anyone. Well, I think that they saw them as different things. And... 
Krishnamacharya definitely did teach philosophy. And he did. was a, yeah. a professor. And not to his yoga students. Yeah. No, because they were a bunch of kids. It, it's, it's like, you know, if you have a yoga student in your class who's 14, are you going to sit them down and tell them about the yamas and nayamas and all this stuff? Not really. Uh, they, they just keep doing your asanas, and uh, we can talk about that later. But if you had somebody who come to your class who was, you know, in their 40s and going through certain things in their life and had some really sincere questions to ask you, you might really go into right. all that stuff. So it was it kind of felt it wasn't relevant, but, you know, inherently relevant, like kind of like a more mechanistic thing. You do this and you're going to get that experience, right? Like you don't need to kind of understand it cerebrally. I mean, you know, because his kids, you know, would have grown up and, and at a certain point, right, they were 18, 19 at a certain point, I think. Uh, BKS Iyengar talks about someone you know teaching him who was a you know yeah BKS himself was when he broke with Krishnamacharya not that young you know who could have been could have been chatting to him on a philosophical level couldn't he but he didn't didn't really get any of that. Well, I think they were somewhat choosy about who they who they imparted their their knowledge to, and that was considered a much higher level of. Uh, Learning. So everybody can do asanas, and everybody can. You know, it's universal. It's like brushing your teeth. So you, you should do it. And if you want to understand how to do it, then generally there is kind of their uh, obligatory duty to try to help you. But as far as talking about the deeper secrets of life and the meaning of God and all of these very deep philosophies, they're not necessarily <laughs> going to tell you about all that unless you ask them and and ask them in just the right way at the right moment and they feel like it uh, that that's a, a that's privileged access <laughs> so um the Tommy joyce didn't speak english very well not well enough to get deeply into philosophy and and it's such an eloquent and deep subject we struggle to understand it even with people who do speak very good English because Sanskrit words, as you know, are not, we don't have equivalents for those in, in English. You know, you take something like the word karma, uh, it, it takes hours to discuss what that actually means and all of its implications. Uh, and it, it really, I think it takes years of listening to different people speak about it in different contexts before we start to really piece together the full uh, interpretation of some of these terms that we throw around very casually all the time in yoga. So it's a conversation amongst cultures. It's what, what I see yoga evolving into. And they're learning from us too. And it's a two-way street. And in, in yoga in India was not considered particularly interesting or special. It was something that's been around for a long time. It was the foreign people who went to Mysore and other parts of India. Mysore is not the only episode of yoga in India, of course. But it was these young people from the West, from Europe and America, who, who said, this is really amazing. I want to learn everything I can about this. I'm going to practice it every day. I want to take this as far as I can take it. Come over to America and teach everybody. Uh, this is a big deal. We're, we're going to... You know, it was really Patabi Joyce's early students, who most of whom I know, who brought the yoga out. So there is this beautiful conversation happening, I, I feel, you know, between cultures. And that's what Mysore Yoga Traditions Conference and, and retreats are all about. I'm very excited about my retreat coming up because Awar, Sri Awar, is the Acharya of Natamini Sampradaya. And I've I've got him, he's agreed to take us to Melkote, where he grew up, and show us all around. We're going to do asanas uh, where Ramanuja bathed and prayed and, and just be in that world for a little while. And nobody can explain it as good as he can. Um, not only did he grow up in that place, but he's the leader of the tradition and he knows all this stuff. We're basically trying to understand it ourselves, step, step at a time, and do your practice and all is coming. You know, that is the, this uh, 
abhyasabhairagya <laughs> term that uh, so so keep practicing and, and engaging in the spiritual practices and listen to everybody's ideas and try to figure it out for ourselves. Like, you know, what does that mean while I'm browsing Facebook? How am I practicing Vyagya while I'm well, that's relevant, actually. Uh, but it's life, and, isn't it? It's it's applied it's applied at philosophy, which is the only philosophy that's worth really debating with, you know. Um so I really appreciate this conversation, um, Andrew, and people can find Andrew um, fairly easily on his Maestro traditions. Um, he's interviewed and talked with so many of uh, Krishnamacharya's uh, students, uh, who are, a couple of them are still alive now, I think. And um, yeah, all kinds of interesting people who are not usually on the radar. So I fully recommend delving into Andrew's uh, world and Andrew's um, you know, incredible amount of um, you know, work you've done on this for, for everyone. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for everyone. Um, what you've, is my, is my yeah, site. we'll put all the links in, in our uh, in our write up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, we're we're doing a series of video um, lectures and courses. We take on different uh, different subjects. Like uh, we just finished one with a Ditya Hurti. Um, where we're going to do Hatha Yoga with Deepika. Uh, we've got Sri Alwar talked into teaching Gita Dasambaha. So that'll be like 32 weeks, eight months worth of uh, study lectures as we go through this. But it's my own education, really. This is what I want to study. And yeah, yeah. I get comes across. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> Always, just, <laughs> <laughs> Always just you. No, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. It's a you know a fascinating history, and I think you've done it justice in explaining it clearly. And yeah, as clear as it can be, um, you know, to uh, to to an audience who you know me included were completely unaware of any of this stuff until fairly recently, really. So um, yeah, thanks again for coming on, and um, I really appreciate thank you, that. Adam. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.